When I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, I had no money. I went to school on a Navy scholarship, which meant that I was willing to do anything for money, including selling my body to science on a weekly basis for psychology experiments. And one of the experiments I did was one called helping the elderly, which seemed like a great idea as long as I was getting paid for it. And it paid about fifty dollars for only about three hours of time. I said that seemed like a little bit on the small side, but since my options were playing video games for no money or getting paid fifty dollars, I chose the responsible route. Short addendum to that story is,、uh, as a college student, I was perpetually out of clean clothes, which means I'd worn almost all of my clothes already right side out and inside out. And the only boxers that were in my boxer drawer、uh, were these glow-in-the-dark smiley face boxer shorts, which I would never have worn otherwise. But I put them on without thinking about it. Ran off to the experiment at Mass General Hospital, where I was met by two cute research assistants who handed me reflectors for each of my joints. Tight white biker shorts, and they said that they had run out of shirts. Would that be okay if I went topless for the experiment? I said that I hadn't been paid fifty dollars, so I, yes, of course. So I went into the changing room, came back out like a topless robot with reflectors on each of my joints, and they told me what I would be doing is walking down an extremely dark hallway while being videotaped by a camera, as each of the reflectors on my joints would record、uh, what was about to happen. What they wanted to do to help the elderly was find ways in which they can help them to prevent injuries when they fall. Of course, you can't get the elderly to fall repeatedly for studies, so they wanted <laughs> college students, and for some reason, they wanted Harvard students to be able to do this experiment. What I would do is walk down a long hallway where one of four things would happen: either as I walked down the hallway in the dark, the floor would suddenly drop out from underneath me, and I'd fall to the floor. Or suddenly the floor would slide out to the right. I'd hit my head on the left and then hit the floor. <laughs> a cord that was attached to my right leg might be yanked out from behind me, cause me to fall face first on the floor. None of these things happen. But at the end of the walkway, they asked me to intentionally fall to the ground, as if to simulate how the elderly intentionally fall. <laughs> I did this for every 30 seconds, for the first hour. 120 falls later. The research assistants came out, still giggling, and said, "We're sorry. We need to do the experiment again. We forgot to put the tape into the tape recorder." <laughs> Would you mind? I said, "No, I haven't gotten paid my fifty dollars yet. I'm sticking with this." Three hours later, 360 falls later, I was met by the head professor for the experiment, and she wanted to find out what was going on. The two research assistants had already gone off the class because they had never ex- expected the experiment to go this long. In fact, the experiment had never gone for the full three hours. And what was most surprising about the experiment is the only time I went for the full three hours was for the participant. Who got paid the least amount of money for the experiment? Turns out it was an experiment not on helping the elderly, which is what I thought, but on motivation. In the midst of the challenges you have, what different types of increments of money could get you to overcome different increments of challenge? I didn't feel very smart, but what she was most shocked about <laughs> was the fact that clearly none of the data could have been used for anything, because in addition to my normal joints, I also seemed to have these extra smiley face glowing joints. <laughs> Throughout the entire thing, I learned several things from this experiment. First of all, I know exactly when and where I should be wearing glow-in-the-dark boxer shorts. But the most important thing I learned was that the difficult part was not the、uh, falling down over and over again for the study. The most difficult part was actually getting back up again. It was 360 push-ups to get myself back off the ground in order to find myself doing the exact same thing over again. What we've experienced over the past two years in the midst of this economic downturn has simulated exactly what I experienced as a freshman. We found that the floor has dropped out from underneath us as stock prices have dropped. We found that our our legs have been yanked out behind us in the midst of our assets decreasing or many of our companies not thriving in the way that we wish they were. What we're finding is is not just the ability to get back up that's difficult, but for everyone here in the room, you're leaders. You help your families. You help your companies to get back up off the ground again, over and over again, knowing full well that there this might not be the end of the falls that we have in front of us. What we wanted to find out is what is it that causes people to be able to thrive in the midst of such of these challenges. Now, the last time I spoke to you was in February of 2008, right before the economic downturn. So you can imagine why I'd be a little bit nervous up here, because the last time I shared research with you, the global economy collapsed.、Um, which I have no idea what I said, but what has happened in the past two years has been extraordinary. What has happened? I've been tra- able to travel to 42 different countries, working with companies and schools worldwide, trying to figure out how we can remain positive in the midst of one of the largest economic downturns of, re- of recent history. And I've learned more about happiness at- during these past two years than in a decade of research at Harvard. 
I wish I had more time to share all this with you, but what I'd like to do is to tell you about what I've been doing with my company. My company is called Good Think Inc. It's a corporate strategy group that brings positive psychology research out to companies to help them to try and thrive in the midst of challenge. The very first foray we had with this was with American Express. This is in the fall of 2008. And when I walked into the room to talk to all the VPs in the room, I suddenly realized something was wrong, terribly wrong. No one was on their BlackBerry. No one, which is a very, very bad sign. Everyone was ashen-faced in the room, and as the HR manager shuffled me up to the front of the room, he told me that they had just announced that the company would actually have to be restructured into a bank, and that there were going to be massive restructuring, even with the people that were inside the room as well. And now for a talk on happiness. I thought it would be one of the most unreceptive audiences we'd had, but they actually canceled their appointments for, a year, uh, for an hour and a half after the normal time that we had set because they were hungry to be able to find out how to create positivity in the midst of the challenges we have. I flew from there out to Zurich, working with Swiss bankers who had just not received their bonuses. They were shattered, devastated, as the financial expectations were not met for them, and you could see their entire world starting to collapse around them. As I then went from Zurich to Zimbabwe, I suddenly realized as I was flying over the savannas of Zimbabwe that I, what was I doing? I was going into a country to speak about happiness to a group of people that are living under the military dictatorship of Robert Mugabe, who are living in a country where their, where their currency had collapsed. When I first landed, I was met by business leaders from the Young President's Organization, and they brought me into dinner, a candlelight dinner, and they said, Sean, how many trillionaires do you know? I sheepishly replied, not very many. And they said, don't be impressed, but everyone in this room is a trillionaire. In fact, Bob spent a million Zim dollars trying to buy a chocolate bar. This is a country where their entire currency had collapsed. I expected to find the worst, and yet what I found was surprising. What I found in Zimbabwe, what I found in Venezuela under the rule of Hugo Chavez, what I found in Thailand in the midst of the riots, in Japan in the midst of deflation, is some of the most optimistic and positive people who are still creating forward progress in the midst of some of the most extraordinary challenges that we had. What was going on? What was going on is confirming what we knew from the scientific research, that if I know all the things in your external world, if I know what cars you drive, what's going on in the economy, the weather, where you live in the world, I can only predict 10% of your long-term happiness. 90% of your long-term happiness is not about the external world, but about how your brain processes the external world, which is why at Harvard we can have students that thrive there, that see it as a privilege, and other students that turn it into a place where they see only the competition, the stress, and the challenges, and they turn what could be a heaven into a hell. The question is, how do we create more positivity in the midst of the challenges we found ourselves over the past two years and as we move forward? In order to do that, we need to research something, and we discovered something called the happiness advantage, which is now what the book is based upon that came out this last month from Random House. The happiness advantage is the discovery that our brains work better at positive than they do at negative, neutral, or stress. In fact, every single business and educational outcome improves when we're positive. The problem is, in the midst of an economic crisis, in the midst of our jobs and our workload, we're finding just the opposite ways of working. In fact, when the conference board survey came out in January of this year, we found, in the midst of high unemployment, the greatest amount of job dissatisfaction in the history of polling. What we're discovering is something extraordinary here, is that I think that the formula that we're using to do our work is flawed. I just spoke this past week here in Houston to St. John's School, which is wonderful. They wanted to have a talk on happiness right before they were, many of the students were taking the PSATs. The reason for that is the happiness advantage. If you can get people to become more positive in the midst of their challenge, they perform significantly better. Their success rates rise, even their intelligence rises. But another school up in New England, New England had a different idea. They said, we know that there's more to just creating uh, uh, performance than just uh, intellect. So we have a wellness week each week, and we invite in experts from around the world, and we pay a lot of money for them. Monday night, we have the world's leading expert on depression. Tuesday night, we have the world's leading expert coming in to talk to students about eating disorders. Wednesday night, we have somebody talking about school violence and teen bullying. And then Thursday night, we have illicit drug use. And then Friday night, we're trying to decide between risky sex or happiness. And I said, well, that's most people's Friday nights, but that... <laughs> they didn't find that funny. They, uh... <laughs> but I said, that's not a wellness week, that's a sickness week. All you've done is describe all the negative things, and the absence of the negative is not 
health. The absence of disease is not health. If you really want to talk about the positive side of the curve, we have to be tapping into those levels of optimism, the social support, and managing energy and stress in a positive way to find a way to get back up off the floor and to help other people to be able to do that as well.